Well worth the struggle. Recent work by Hall Grote Sr. and Hall Grote II at the Beard Gallery, which is part of the Cultural Council of Cortland County, affiliated with State University of New York at Cortland, SUNY. Central New York contemporary artists Hall Grote Sr. of Manlius and Hall Grote II of Enwell will be exhibiting a thought-provoking and adventurous cross-section of recent oil paintings in an exhibit entitled Well Worth the Struggle, which explores the formal and conceptual relationships between the work of a father and son artist. The exhibit invites the viewer to examine the duality between Hallgrove II's mysterious, often satirical, manner of still life metaphors that blur the boundaries between the familiar and the unconventional, and Hallgrove Sr.'s evocative, painterly architectural, landscape, and figurative work that melds representation with abstraction making allusions often to 20th century modernism. So well worth the struggle, involving two Central New York artists, Hall Grote Sr. and Hall Grote II, will be on view at the Beard Gallery located at 9 Main Street in downtown Cortland, which is the historic district, about five minutes away from SUNY Cortland. At the New Blood Gallery in the United Kingdom, one critic states, while Hall Grote II's classical technique and manners palette is quite sumptuous, these still life metaphors slightly churn the stomach. Oozing with fat and dripping in money, these paintings question our society and the foundations underpinning it. Is society built on liberty or money? How does liberty sit with consumerism and or violence? Arabesque compositions, viscous textures, and even the inclusion of a particular vintage timepiece must surely pay tribute to Dolly. Sharing perhaps a surreal yet figurative aesthetic, this work remains distinctly Grote-esque. So anyways, a little bit about my work. I have 15 paintings on exhibit. They're all in oil on canvas, ranging in dates from uh, the year 2009 approximately, all the way up through this current year, 2014. All the subjects involve some element of food. For the most part, they're desserts. And I'm very fascinated with the idea of brand identity within this exhibit that you'll get to see. You're gonna see brand identity ranging from Mars Corporation, which manufactures M&Ms, all the way to Skittles, all the way to the idea of a dirty martini, to this uh, provocative piece, which shows the juxtaposition of uh, a pile of coins with handcuffs with this strawberry shortcake. In a nutshell, my work is meant to make use of an aesthetic, a 17th century Baroque aesthetic, and integrates the idea of chiaroscuro, light and shadow, with more of a contemporary sense of composition. So with a lot of the pieces you'll see, I get very close in on the subject and approach the piece and the compositions in a little bit more of an atypical way. So this is one of the first pieces I created that's part of the series. It's a 30 by 40 inch oil painting once again. The title is Insatiable. And a little bit behind this piece, I was inspired uh, several years ago, attended a wedding and uh, was really captivated by the idea of a large section of wedding cake and at the time was really enthralled by the idea of chocolate dripping. So I decided, why not make this larger and life-size painting of a section of wedding cake? Obviously there's the cherry, and then around it, and this uh, circular composition is positioned some coins with some melting chocolate. So being the first piece of the series, this piece sort of led into an investigation of all these other subjects and a lot of them, as I mentioned, deal with pop culture subjects like M&Ms, we have the Hershey Kisses that repeat, and a lot of other things that you'll see soon. Another aspect to this piece is the idea of metaphor, which is something that reoccurs in a lot of my works. Uh, the idea of insatiable, referencing the title. We live in a society where we don't get enough. We want the bigger, we want the better. We want the supersized french fries, hamburger. We want uh, that best car. 
people in upstate New York love their Humvees. We can't get enough. We're never satisfied. We want more and more money. Does that actually bring us happiness? That's what we need to question. So this piece, perhaps as a metaphor, we look at this large section of cake with dripping chocolate. The chocolate is uh, sort of cascading down from the piles of coins, which are maybe referencing uh, skyscrapers or the amassing of wealth. And uh, that's one way of looking at it. Or you can look at it as just a delicious piece of cake that makes you hungry. So all of my paintings on exhibit are all oil on canvas. And a lot of people ask me, do you paint from photography? None of these are painted from photographs. They're all painted from direct observation. And in my studio, I have like shelves of like hundreds of different objects. And a lot of people ask me, do you eat these desserts? Well, I have, I've, I've had a few of them. These actually, this, these Skittles are from like 10 years ago. And this uh, chocolate bunny rabbit is actually in my bottom shelf. Right now it's about petrified along with some of the uh, McDonald's French fries. Actually, believe it or not, thinking back to the idea of uh, supersize, I have McDonald's French fries that are 10 years old that haven't changed from that day. They must put something in those French fries to preserve them. But at any rate, all of these objects are painted from life and I set them up on a table with a light source, sometimes it's on the right, sometimes on the left, sometimes from above, and never have a preconceived idea of what my composition's gonna be. Typically, I just have a rough idea of what I wanna paint. So in this particular one, Reese's Pieces, made by Mars Candy Company. I knew that I wanted that to be the main focus, and I set that up into the composition, and I typically start with an undertone of just real, real uh, muted umber tone. And then as the piece evolved, I decided to introduce these other elements into it. And through the process, I decided towards the end to actually title it Metropolis, sort of referencing to like city, community, urban environment with all these objects sort of melting together. Well, this was a piece that I painted about six months after the Insatiable piece, and the title is Global Currency. And it's interesting, back at the time, I really wasn't thinking about what the piece said to me, but based on a lot of what's going on around the world now, thinking about the idea of food, money, looking at uh, a lot of... Uh, different media sources, we start to think about like what is going on with like hyperinflation, what's gonna happen to the cost of food, vegetables especially. I'm noticing Wegmans, like produce is like skyrocketing at this point. And then we think back to uh, some of the alternative media sources from a few years ago, referencing the idea of what George Soros is doing, trying to create this global currency to sort of offset the impending Chinese one. So like a lot of the other pieces, I'm attempting to break the rules of composition and explore a new model, perhaps a new archetype, because when we think about paintings from the past, especially post-impressionist paintings like by Cezanne, the, the objects were always on a table top. There was always a reference to the table top, but with a lot of my pieces, there's no table top and the objects become larger in life. And you'll notice from a lot of the pieces, the objects push off all four sides of the pictorial box to suggest to the viewer that the scene image is continuing onward. Uh, and I'm always looking for ways to explore composition in a less conventional way, especially with this one. So this large piece of the M&Ms, this was actually the piece that I painted after the large section of cake called uh, Insatiable. So with this piece, I knew I wanted to paint the M&Ms and make them larger in life. Once again, this is 40 inches tall by 30 inches wide. And knew that I wanted to introduce the idea of money into the composition to sort of interweave the uh, whole series together. So in this one, once again, we have melting chocolate on top of these quarters and silver dollars. 
with all of these different colored M&Ms. And just like the one of the martini that we spoke about before, this particular piece does have some indirect painting methods that I use. And here there's some glazing to allow to uh, push these m and forms back into darkness. Up here I actually glaze with some alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, sort of give it that uh, hazy quality. And set up, in this case, the light was from the right side. And with some of these forms, there's a lot more glazing than one would realize. This has about maybe 10 layers of glaze to So this piece we're looking at is entitled uh, Dirty Martini. I've been actually painting images, pieces involving cocktail glasses for about 10 years now and uh, also have been exploring this pocket watch that you see here that's on top of these old dilapidated books. This is actually the book of Dante up here. So I decided to use this, this large form here more in like a pop culture way the idea of a martini glass larger than life and then behind it this nostalgic image of this these books with this uh, watch and then over here on the side is that subtle reference to the coins and this piece like some of the others is based on chiaroscuro a lot of light and shadow but what makes this a little bit different is the introduction of a little bit of uh, glazing on top you notice how the books go back in the space and unlike some of the other ones this one I'm able to pull the martini glass forward push the books back to give it more of that uh, 17th century feel baroque feel of uh, darkness so this piece of the great big monumental Hershey's Kiss was painted oh, about 2011 and I wanted to paint this huge kiss because at the time I was painting a lot of smaller daily studies that were about on the 8 by 10, 5 by 7 scale. I got a little bit tired of that so I decided to make this great big Hershey's kiss. And just like what I was suggesting with Insatiable, the fact that we're never satisfied with what we have, we always want more and more and more. Well at the time there was a lot of uh, commercials on TV referencing to the new McDonald's uh, jingle, the idea of like supersize, something bigger than life, more, have that great big shake. So I decided to call this supersize kiss, sort of like a monument to this. All right, so the three pieces over here in the wall are all uh, 24 by 30 inches, once again, oil on canvas. This was actually the first of the series, uh, titles Blood Money. This was actually painted after the M&Ms and actually after the one with Reese's Pieces. And at the time, I was doing a lot of other small paintings, 8 by 10 paintings, 8 by 10 inch paintings of peanut butter and jelly with all different uh, crazy types of compositions. And I decided, why not try something a little bit more bizarre, a little bit different? So I sort of played with the scale, have the peanut butter and jelly sort of cut in that, that classical fashion where it's cropped off the edge and then decided to explore a composition again and have these stacks of coins coming up with all of the peanut butter and jelly dripping down onto the coins and once again I'm inviting the viewer to really look at the relationships between those two things, those two elements. So with a lot of my pieces it's all about association. You have brand identity, you have food, you have money, then you start to look at those relationships and the viewer can bring any meaning to the piece that they want. And that's really, I think, the beauty of a lot of art. Art's ability to uh, you know, communicate to people in different ways. This piece over here, it's called Bad Money. It was the piece that I painted after the Blood Money. And this pocket watch, once again, which I've painted many, many times in very classical 8 by 10 paintings and uh, 8 by 10 inch paintings and some larger pieces, I decided why not just put the pocket watch right in there with the uh, cheesecake. And I've had some people say that this is sort of like a reference to Salvador Dali's melting clock. I suppose it could be, depending on uh, what you've seen. But this particular silver 
plate. I've painted many times and just want to, wanted to explore the connection between the cake, the money, and the clock. And then over here, this is a piece called Dirty Money, which is part of this uh, series. You know, we have dirty money, bad money, and then blood money. This piece over here actually has been exhibited in quite a few museums and galleries throughout the United States. It was recently part of the uh, Southern Biennial exhibit down in uh, Corning, New York. That was a few months ago. And right down here on the very bottom, there's a reference to Chinese Yuan. It's very, very subtle. And that particular one actually appears in a few of the other pieces, too. So this is a 24-inch by 30-inch piece. The title's Bling Bling. A uh, little bit of a story behind these handcuffs. Actually, it was a student of mine from about six years ago who brought these into uh, my college painting class, and they were like the subject of many of her paintings. And I was like, sort of like taken back by that, and uh, got inspired watching her paint. I mean, she actually used them in several paintings, and she said at the end, Professor Grote, you can take those home; they're yours. And so I decided one day, well, why not just paint the handcuffs. And so I decided one day just to figure out a way to compose the handcuffs with the uh, strawberry shortcake, with the coins. And it's sort of interesting to look at the relationship between the reflectivity of the metal, the hardness of the metal, the sheen of the metal against that soft cake. Last summer I asked my grandson, he's 17 years old, where he would like to go on a little trip with me. And so we just did a day trip to New York City. And the first place we went is High Line on the west side. And we walked all the way down from uptown, all the way down as far as we could go towards the Trade Center. And on that nice walk, which is no red lights and no corners, it's wonderful to walk on High Line. But they're doing constant renovations of old factories and buildings and turning them into gorgeous apartments. You know, and uh, these three buildings, different places, show the way they looked at the when we were there. And um, <clears throat> this was the first painting I did. This is the second one and the third one, but they're all within a half a mile of each other. But I just, I just, I like structural things, and I think these. This is the epitome of my style originally, as I did a lot of things with railroad yards and things and girders. I'm, I'm actually a kind of, I was kind of born in the Ashcan school, you might say. And I like all those bellows paintings and Sloan paintings, and that's what I'm interested in. I look at this Brooklyn rooftops painting, it makes me think that What's it all about, this art, this struggle in art? And then I came up with a title for this whole show, Well Worth the Struggle. And it kind of shows in this Brooklyn painting. The, the, the struggling, the smoke, you can't even see New York, it's the air so dirty here. And, and people trying to get a little bit of sun on top of their rooftops, under umbrellas, there's people uh, sunbathing and everything, and boxcars, Stored, storing things, empty warehouses. That's what I like to paint. I like that kind of painting. Mm -hmm. I was very active in the former Syracuse Symphony Orchestra and I did a lot of sketching and wrote articles for them and created many, many paintings based on the symphony. And this isn't all imagination. There's nobody here that's any real person in memory, but I just made up the scene. 
and a lot of my paintings of symphonies are based on tanglewood as well and the uh, it's always fun to go up in the Berkshire Mountains and hear music. This is kind of an outdoor feeling, and that's what I remember about Tangle. For two years, we lived at Casanova Lake, and this is Carpenter's Pond across the street from the actual lake. It's a little pond that uh, lily pads and things makes you think of Monet in a way, but. Um, this is called Carpenter's Pond, and I like to use a lot of texture. And so you'll notice in some of these paintings a tremendous buildup of paint. When my parents were first married, they talked about taking the night boat from Albany, New York, to New York City what a thrill it was, dancing and partying on the boat. This sort of stayed in my mind. And then I came across the, this, these old photos and uh, etchings of uh, the North Star. That's Actually, it's a very small boat. And they'd go up the Hudson River. And this small boat way back then, probably in the 1920s, went all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. These guys had a lot of nerve. It's so dangerous to do in a small boat like this. But anyway, Vanderbilt would have his parties and his friends and they'd go on excursions up the Hudson River. Here we have Columbia University in the distance. You can see a few towers and things and buildings and the historic church over here. But in this painting, I was more intrigued more than the subject matter, I was intrigued with the coloration, the time of day. Uh, obviously, the, the sun is hitting this foliage and lighting it up, and the clouds are taking on a beautiful, you know, the, the pink against the uh, turquoise colors makes a very pleasant painting. And I would have liked to go in on that boat. Oh, it's always fun going to Niagara Falls. You never get tired of watching these tons of water piling over. In this one, I tried to capture that icy winter look and the, the froth coming over here in the suds it looks like icicles, the way it's hanging down. When I was about 12 years old, my parents bought me an oil painting set and the first painting I ever did in oil was Niagara Falls from the base looking up. Now this painting is from looking down, so now I'm all done with the Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. I was very active in the former Syracuse Symphony Orchestra and I did a lot of sketching and wrote articles for them and created many, many paintings based on the symphony. And this isn't all imagination. There's nobody here that's any real person in memory, but I just made up the scene. And a lot of my paintings of symphonies are based on Tanglewood as well. And the, uh, it's always fun to go up in the Berkshire Mountains and hear music. This is kind of an outdoor feeling. And that's what I remember about Tanglewood. For two years, we lived at Casanova Lake. And this is Carpenter's Pond across the street from the actual lake. It's a little pond that uh, lily pads and things, makes you think of Monet in a way. But um, this is called Carpenter's Pond and I like to use a lot of texture. And so you'll notice in some of these paintings a tremendous buildup of paint. Last summer, I asked my grandson, he's 17 years old, where he would like to go on a little trip with me. And so we just did a day trip to New York City, and the first place we went is Highline on the west side, and we walked all the way down from uptown, all the way down 
as far as we could go towards the Trade Center. And on that nice walk, which is no red lights and no corners, it's wonderful to walk on High Line, but they're doing constant renovations of old factories and buildings and turning them into uh, gorgeous apartments, you know. And uh, these three buildings, different places, show the way they looked at the, when we were there. And um, <coughs> this was the first painting I did, this is the second one, and the third one. But they're all within a half a mile of each other. But I just, I just, I like structural things. And I think these, this is the epitome of my style originally, as I did a lot of things with railroad yards and things and girders. I'm, I'm actually a kind of, I was kind of born in the Ashcan school, you might say. And I like all those bellows paintings and Sloan paintings. And that's what I'm interested in. Paul Grote Sr., an American Impressionist painter, is a native of Syracuse, New York, where he studied painting, worked towards his Master of Fine Arts degree, and began his lifelong career as an artist. Grote has dedicated his entire full-time professional career, spanning over 40 years, to pursuing his passion of art. The Berkshire Museum has, was the first of several museums worldwide to acquire a major Grote work, the museum purchased the prize winner, Megalopolis, one of the largest of Grote's railroad paintings. This is where the late Norma Rockwell first discovered him and invited the then 29-year-old to dinner in the Berkshires. The United Nations awarded Grote with the honor of having a series of paintings for the stamp reproduction. The series of 10 paintings is in the permanent collections of the United Nations Philatelic Museum in Geneva, Switzerland. In addition, Grote's paintings are included in the collections of notables, such as President Jimmy Carter, the late Jacob Javits, Henry Kissinger, Fred Perry, Sir Michael Tibbet, Christopher Keene, and the late Arthur Fiedler. Ambassadors, among countless others, have invested in his work. In recent years, Grote has turned his attention to the corporate world with emphasis on banks, churches, brokerage houses, and insurance companies. His work is included in numerous corporate collections throughout the world today. Clemmer Greenberg, one of the nation's foremost art critics from the 20th century, once stated that Hall Grote was an artist who could make it, and he certainly has proven this correct. Through the use of metaphor, I often incorporate various social and political issues through the verse still life forms that are connected with both our consumer-driven culture and natural environment. Quirky associations involving the machine, brand identity, food, monetary currency, and nature may serve as icons of consumerism, invoke hunger, or question the duality of nature and the machine. I'm drawn to the transformative qualities of these objects. A single object may speak of spiritual stillness and timelessness or engage the viewer in a very different dialogue when combined with other elements. Painting that merges modern art discoveries with a classical aesthetic often pushes me towards subjects that blur the boundaries between the familiar and the unconventional. Painter Hallgrove II, professor and chair of the art and design department at SUNY Broome Community Colleges teaches foundation courses in painting, drawing, and computer graphics. Grote earned a Master of Fine Arts degree in painting and drawing from the City University of New York at Brooklyn, a Bachelor of Arts in Art History, minoring in Studio Art at Binghamton University, and attended graduate and certificate programs at Buffalo State College, Syracuse University, and Savannah College of Art and Design. He also attended summer sessions at Chautauqua School of Art in Chautauqua, New York, and Vermont Studio Center in Johnston, Vermont. Grote has had one-person exhibitions at Ebers Museum of Art, Robertson Museum of Art, Finger Lakes Community College, Casanova College, Jasper Rand Art Museum, Lemoyne College, Wadsworth Athenium Museum of Art, and Washington Jefferson College and has participated in dozens of group shows throughout the United States. 
In 2004, Groot was included in the Roberson Museum Center's exhibition Cosmos and Chaos, the Cultural Paradox with artists Lucian Freud, Eric Fischel, Jerome Wicken, and several other contemporary artists. His work is included in private and public collections internationally, including Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones, Clear Channel Communications, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cellular One, House and Garden Limited, Sheraton Hotel Corporation, Binghamton University, Evers Museum of Art, Munson William Proctor Institute of Art, the State University of New York System, Roberts Museum and Science Center, and Washington Jefferson College.